Behind the hedges and front doors in 98 towns in Britain live the 15,000 members of a most secretive Christian sect. They keep themselves separate as much as possible from the world because they consider it the domain of the devil. For this reason, they've never before spoken on television, until now. On this program, priests of the sect speak for the first time. Well, we're, we're often referred to as exclusive brethren because uh, we practice separation from evil, if you like, the exclusion of evil. Well, I think we would have a saying which uh, is in the world but not of it. Um, and that would be our pathway. We're not taking a, a higher position than anybody because we, we take the position we are more responsible than any others. That's one thing we would say, we are the most responsible people on this earth. But there is a darker side. Exclusive brethren choose to follow a rigid code of conduct based strictly on Bible teaching enforced by the leadership. Breaking the rules can result in expulsion, isolation from family, and psychological damage that has led to suicide. Well, I think that the Brethren's attitude of family life is, is hypocritical, because they say so much about the family, but they are, are seen to break up families. There is a warm, loving feeling while you're in, but it's what they do to those who want to leave. They're all meant to be Christians, and they don't act like it, really. Exclusive Brethren meeting rooms have no windows. Gatekeepers ensure privacy. They keep their contact with the outside world to a minimum. Their only safe places are the meeting rooms and their own houses in a world they see as ruled by the devil. We're, we're fully aware of the devil. You might say that I, I, I myself have been caught by the devil many times. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Where do you see him in the world? Well, it's quite simple. In the media, as one uh, that would be um, the, the, where the devil would, would, would be because um, of his uh, influence on, on mankind, uh, the television, the radio. Their doctrine of separation means that they do not make friends or even eat with worldly people. They're building their own schools and in the last 30 years have refused college education to their children. Brethren used to go to university, but uh, that was uh, pointed out through, through the leader at that time. Um, that uh, it was not protective at all. In fact, many that went to university uh, have left us, and um, many that are still in fellowship with us regret ever going through that sort of learning process. The influences at university um, are not helpful at all in a moral sense. We're trying to lead a life discerning between what's right and wrong, refusing evil, choosing good, and uh, that's where, why, the reason we don't go to university. They largely work in their own businesses, providing each other with jobs and mortgages. Men don't wear ties, women don't cut their hair, and follow the biblical rule to cover their heads with a distinctive head. Members marry only within the sect. Divorce is rare. This film follows events over two years. Owen Cook was born into the Brethren. He was disciplined by the leadership in Hawley, Surrey, when his parents reported him for having a girlfriend who was a worldly. When it was actually confirmed that I was with a, a girl that wasn't in the religion, I was withdrawn from, you know, completely taken away from it, so I couldn't have anything to do with them. Withdrawn from means that Owen was declared evil and isolated from the meeting, even from family members. Withdrawal, that's where a serious sin comes to light. 1 Corinthians 5 speaks about certain serious sins and uh, we would then have to withdraw from a person 
if they weren't repentant, if they weren't getting right about it. St. Paul commanded the men of Corinth that if anyone called brother be fornicator or avaricious or idolater or abusive or a drunkard or rapacious, not to mix with him. Remove the wicked person from amongst yourselves. Owen would have understood the consequences of his, his actions. Um, we are brought up, we are, we are taught from a young age as a standard we abide by. The priests in Hawley ordered Owen to remain with his parents while his brothers and sisters were placed away from home. After two years, Owen brought the family together again by leaving it. It was at that point I really, really realised that um, I was totally on my own. And the same night, I actually drove past the house and all the family had come back, all the cars and we were all back in the drive. I think that's about the hardest thing about it, is leaving your family behind. There's no, no question about it because um, there's nothing like your own family and you can never replace them. Well, the right hand windows are in my old bedroom and that's where I used to live. But, um, I miss being with my family. That's the only bit I don't like driving past and thinking. Well, in Hawley, Rygate, Red Hill and Dawkins put together, there's probably about 400 of them, if not more now, because they're, they're multiplying quite quickly <laughs> in the baby world. On the right hand side down here is uh, one of the brethren houses, detached house. First one you see there. Why did they have to be detached? Um, to be separate from the rest of the world so that they're not, they're not, um, they're not sharing anything. This morning, there were around about seven to eight hundred people in there, um, including around about twenty-five of my own family, um, some of which I don't know about, new babies and or nephews and nieces. There's a lot more people in there that would have um, been gone a long time ago, but they can't walk away from their family, which is understandable. I'd like to be with them, but I don't want to go in there. In just a few months, Owen's longing to be with his family was to prove too strong an emotion to withstand. One of the priests confesses that he recently left the faith for a time. I was the most unsettled person you would ever have met nine months ago. I was uncouth, I was a nasty person, but thank God he worked in my soul. And I mean every word of what I say. I'm still tested, I'm still a normal man, I still have desires to do things that aren't in accord with scripture and I think my colleagues would say the same but it's something that just holds you it's a conscience it's a work of God in a soul you can never ever get rid of once it's set there brethren can find it impossible to leave but one ex-member now out in the world has decided to help escapers and as far as possible to monitor brethren activity. St. Cloud, Minnesota, on the banks of the Mississippi River, is the base for Dick Wyman's operations. The brethren were deliberately trying to conceal their activities from the general public, and I wanted to provide a counterbalance to this secretiveness that the brethren you know, insist on maintaining about themselves. Wyman, a senior executive in a computer company, founded a website which links former brethren scattered around the world. In October 2000, there was an anonymous message from someone claiming to be a brethren insider. For Wyman, it could be a vital source of information from within the sect. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know if he was someone who the brethren were trying to set up to um, uh, somehow in get secret information about the website or about me that they might use to uh, uh, against me in some sort of a lawsuit. Um, and so for a long time, I couldn't trust him. 
uh, and was very suspicious of what he was telling me. Wyman knew that no Brethren member should have access to computers because the leader has declared all modern technology evil. Today, Brethren refer to what they claim is a New Testament prophecy that the man of sin, who will emerge in the last times, will use computers to control the world. The whole uh, IT system, if you like, the computer area, is, uh, <coughs> is marked and running into the uh, man of sin um, in Revelation. Um, the number 666, I'm sure you'll know about and there it is, barcodes and everything. So we seek just simply to live a life separate from that. It's where they can actually lead to and what they can lead to uh, is, is the problem that we, we have with them. The insider is keeping concealed a laptop computer and a mobile phone and filming with a camcorder, all forbidden by Brethren rules. Through the internet, he discovered a world of instant communication that the Brethren believe stems from the evil one that St. John calls the Prince of the Power of the Air. These are the insider's words. There was a Brethren urban myth about a huge quantity of anti-Brethren propaganda on the internet. Part of the sense of our own importance is bound up with being under attack. It's a kind of justification. I decided to look for it. November 2000. Dick contacted Jill Mitten in London. Jill left the Brethren in the 60s and is now a counselling psychologist. Her study of former members of the sect shows that many suffer from the symptoms of post-traumatic stress. When you're within the Brethren, there is a certain sense of warmth and security and, and being taken care of and, and your problems are solved for you. So there is a warm, loving feeling while you're in. But it's what they do to those who want to leave. Um, family members who are ostracized and rejected. They are very destructive. Wyman asked her to assess the Brethren contact. A secret meeting with the insider was set up at a London station. We were both very nervous about meeting each other, but he was in particularly nervous because, of course, the Brethren are sometimes seen on that station. Um, and they may well have spotted him. Um, I think once we got into the coffee area, he, he felt safer because that's not a place they're likely to frequent. I liked him immediately. I saw someone who was quite a gentle person who um, was quite shy and yet very articulate. From that time, Jill knew that former brethren could rely on information from the insider since beginning to interact with him since that beginning I've um, I've modified my own position with respect to the brethren to, to some extent become a little more conciliatory a little more willing to see them as as not demonic and totally evil Dick now has a valuable source of information inside the sect well, often he can, he can confirm something that I hear from another source. I, I don't like to put things on the website until, as news until I've had confirmation from some second party. Well, I have confirmation of a report I first received this past Thursday. Um, a, man about, uh, a man had left the Brethren in Auckland, New Zealand at the age of 17, some 30 years ago. Um, his body was found hanging uh, from a tree on the grounds of a meeting room in Perth, Western Australia on Tuesday. It's thought that he committed suicide on Sunday. Uh, apparently had a family. Uh, 30 years is a long time. You know, you would think that a person would be adjusted to life outside the Brethren. 
but to go to a, a meeting room a long ways away from home and commit suicide there, I, I imagine, is intended to send a message to the brethren. Exclusives were founded 170 years ago as Plymouth Brethren by J. N. Darby, an aristocratic Anglican minister. It was a reaction to what he saw as the worldliness of society. By 1880, there were 800 meeting rooms in Britain and many more worldwide. The sect has always been rich and encourages its members to have large families. When an American, James Taylor, emerged as the universal leader in the 1920s, they became known as the Taylorite Exclusive Brethren. Schisms have occurred all through their history. In 1970, when their leader, Taylor's son, known as Big Jim Taylor, was discovered in bed with one of his female followers, 8,000 decided to leave, and many families were split. June 2001. Some of the 42,000 brethren worldwide assemble at a meeting room near Coventry, attended by the universal leader at the time, John S. Hales, from Sydney, Australia. Throughout their history, their leaders have been granted status as the man of God, with overall power over members of the sect. If you think of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, how he was here on earth, he was the most approachable, humble, lowly man he says i'm in the midst of you midst of you as the one that serves and that's how these men are they they don't hold their lives as dear to themselves they 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 put themselves at the service of others it becomes apparent because of moral power and authority and the upholding of everything that's gone before in the great men that have led us in the recovery from j and d down to the present day they've been prepared to come down to our level and if you like, lift us out of the mire, help us forward. But failure to obey the rules that enforce separation from ordinary life means ejection into a world for which they are unprepared. It was a known thing ever since you were 12 that if you ever left, that you'd go to hell, you'd burn in hell forever, and um, that you'd never be able to speak to any of your family or anyone that you'd ever known for your childhood in the brethren ever again that you'd just be ignored and, you know, like you didn't exist. I mean, I, I did know that, but I just... I didn't actually think I'd feel the way that I did after I left, how much it would hurt. Laura Knight lost her family when she finally left the Brethren, but she's making a new one. After five years outside, she's had two children by different fathers. There go. I've made two mistakes, but they're the best mistakes I've ever made. <laughs> you know, I've had two bad relationships, but I've got two beautiful things from them, and I don't regret a day of it because they are everything to me. All the love that I can't give to my family is now ploughed into them children, and they will never go without love. Recently I met Trevor. He's asked me to be his wife, which I'm really happy about. He's 18. <laughs> He's a toy boy. <laughs> He's the best thing that's happened to me since I left the Brethren except my children. Top of the big hill over there. Laura left one night with the help of a friend. She got a job in a factory a hundred miles away from her home in Portsmouth. But her parents traced her. Um, two bottles and two dried, please. Two bottles yeah. They spent ages talking to me and saying that if I didn't go back, they'd never be able to speak to me again, um, that, that I'd be condemned forever, and I was doing something really evil, all the things they normally say to try and make you go back. And I just said no. I had to be really strong, and it was really hard. And after they went, I was able to cry, but at the time I had to be really strong, because if they'd seen me weak, they would have been able to play on that and take me home. I think I got really that lonely that I started missing my family and then the doubt started to creep in. Well, what if they're right? What if I do end up going to hell? I don't want to burn forever in hell and all that sort of thing. And that actually made, eventually made me go back. Thank you. I, I turned up at my parents' house and said I've come home and my mum was like, obviously overjoyed and threw her arms around me and things. And then afterwards realised that she should probably have just phoned the leaders and said, you know, she's come home. 
Um, when she did, they came and took me away um, to this house in Cosham on my own. Although she returned home, Laura was shut up in what was at the time an empty brethren house. Being shut up is based on the biblical procedure for the treatment of lepers. Laura was denied access to her family by the priests. I think at the time I just accepted what they said. It was just really hard and I said to them, you know, how long am I going to be here? And they said, well, until we think you're forgiven, until we feel God's forgiven you. Um, it could be a few months, it could be a year. And at the time that was like, oh, I've got to live here, nothing to do, no one to talk to except them and they'll come round. It was just desperately, desperately lonely and I think that was probably the closest I've ever been to being insane. She actually left home um, on her own free will, her own choice, to uh, go off with a, with a man and uh, she returned to her father's house after eight months of being away and uh, because the matter's been unclear in what has transgressed during that time um, she was provided with a, a fully furnished bungalow uh, which belonged to brethren um, and uh, she was provided with uh, what she needed to uh, to be able to live she was provided with a telephone she was provided with a car to get to a job which was found for her by the brethren and uh, she was visited daily by persons that would take an interest uh, in consideration for her in every way once a day every day and after five weeks um, she returned to her family as restored Laura endured her treatment by the priests because she didn't want to lose her family. But she eventually realized she could no longer accept the brethren's beliefs and left again. I've learned to make a new life for myself and try and accept my old one and just hope that in sometime in the future it's going to change and that they'll um, talk to me and be a part of my life whilst letting me get on with my life. Like I let them have their beliefs. I hope that they're one day letting me have mine. June 2001. Using his electronic gadgets, the insider continues to send messages, but at a risk. If he's discovered to be communicating with worldlies, he can lose his home, his job in a brethren business, and like Laura, be banished from his family. The risk is no greater having all of my electronic gadgets than if I had one of them. The discovery of even one of them would result in my being forcibly removed. The conviction that something is wrong, just because the brethren say it is, is frustrating. There's no way round it. I cannot change anybody's mind and say, look, there's no sense in it, because sense doesn't come into it. Sense is not even under consideration. Exclusive brethren have such a fear of worldly contamination that they view divided families as an inevitable consequence of a member leaving. I just knew I had to get out of the Brethren. Um, I'm not sure what actually brought me to that final decision, but it was a process. It came to a point where my position in the Brethren was untenable. Four years ago, Andy Giles lost his family, as well as his home and job, when he left the Brethren in Worthing. I was unhappy. Um, I disagreed with a lot of their ideas on separation from the world and isolation from the world and I was basically living a lie I was giving lip service to something that I was by the day becoming more in disagreement with and he knew the price he would have to pay now divorced he was cut off from his children well marriage amongst the brethren they have a saying we well, must be married to the assembly before you married your wife. It's an underlying understanding in every brethren marriage that the, the fellowship comes first. And we were married for 11 years before I finally left, at which time we had four children. Finding it impossible to leave, 
Andy did something that would ensure his ejection from the Brethren. He committed adultery. It's not something I'm proud of. I'm utterly ashamed of it, really. But I was desperate to get out of the Brethren, and I went. In fact, that was a Friday. I went back and said, told them what I'd done. And I was instantly, from that point on, I was cut off. I never, I've never actually had a conversation with my wife since then, since that moment. Um, I was terrified of taking my wife and family into the world and the brethren's stories being true and having my, my children destroyed by the devil, basically. I actually thought it would be better for them at that point to stay in the brethren. I actually signed a form that a separation, deed of separation that the brethren produced, which enabled my wife to continue going to the meetings. So I signed that and that document actually said that I would have no access to the children. The priests would only talk to us about Andy's case in general terms. Every case is looked at on its own merits as it is in every walk of life. You can't just, there's no statement, flat bang statement that says, this is what happens that, if that's, that's the case. Each case is looked at, it's looked at on its own merits. If he was determined to go his own way and say he was unfaithful to his wife, say he committed something like adultery, which we would regard seriously, obviously there would be a separation. Normally that would be a legal separation. Divorcees are not allowed to remarry in the Brethren. So she will never have someone else. There'll never be a father figure in that house again. They'll be told that I'm, well, I'm evil. I've gone off into the world. And the devil's got control of my heart. They will be told something like that. In a bid to gain access to his children, Andy has a. Well, I'm evil. I've gone off into the world. And the devil's got control of my heart they would be told something like that in a bid to gain access to his children Andy has arranged a meeting with his local priests well the uh, house we're just coming up to is the house of Stuart McIntyre who's the leader of the Brighton meeting he's quite a forceful character um, but I think I know him well enough not to be too scared of him. In order to keep a record, Andy is using a concealed camera. Um, the main reason for coming out, I just wanted to talk to you about the children. Yeah. Um, I feel I really need to see them again. Why don't you find your children by finding the law again? I don't think I could return to that. I accept fully that you were treated with about as rough as you could be treated. Mm. But at the moment, you know, what you're raising is a very serious matter, and we want to protect those dear children. You see, the devil's got a hold of you. You might think it's different, but if you see what God did at the cross, go over and over and over it, I think you'll find your position is absolutely untenable. Well, it's a selfish way, isn't it, really, Andrew? I mean, that is basically the issue of selfishness, isn't it? That you want to do your own, you want your own way. Well, at the moment, I just want to see my children. Eh? At the moment, I just want to see my children. And your children want to see you, but they want to see you right. Yeah. Well, oh well. we'll do what we can, and we'll, you, we'll pray, and you just think over what Derek and we've said tonight. Oh well. Go over things and see right. whether really you... I've lost your link with the same. Yeah. Oh well. Um, okay. They did promise to look into it, and they said they would get back to me, which I was actually um, quite pleased with that result because I was expecting a 
um, a downright refusal to cooperate with any attempt for me to see the children without me going back to the brethren. Four months after that meeting, Andy receives a letter from the elders refusing him any contact with his children. I just want them to know that they have got a father who cares for them and loves them. And I would love, love it if eventually some of them had the guts to leave themselves. The insider keeps up his double life, attending meetings and secretly emailing worldlies outside. July 2001, an email message brings news to Dick Wyman in Minnesota and to Jill Mitten in London. The insider's computer has been discovered. He's under pressure to give it up or face ejection. But the insider makes contact. Hi, Dick. I get very depressed about it all. But it's got but to be settled, settled soon. soon. In the meantime, I must be more tense than I know because I have headaches most days. It won't be long before I'll willingly go to the slaughter just to stop the continual grinding down. Expulsion from the Brethren tore the Wallach family apart. Today, they're picking up the pieces, but there are family members still inside. I can't believe you used to wear it either. No one, no one got away with those tights. I've become a completely different person. That's one reason why I, I like to dress differently. I've had my hair done differently. Because I, am, I have to be somebody completely different and leave the past behind, otherwise I'd be forever dwelling on what happened, you know? You'd never, you, I had to break free of it to be able to rebuild our lives together as a family. Is there anything you want to keep? It's a bit of Roman Egyptian, I have my earrings. It's going across the road to the pub. <laughs> it started when their sons, Neil and Rob, were mixing with worldly people in a local pub. They were the ones that, um, in Breton language, originally transgressed, um, going to pubs and late night clubs and they were the ones that were initially seen as, as ringleaders even among the young boys and teenagers in the Brethren. And uh, unfortunately they came home on Sunday and Saturday night in an inebriated state. It was actually early in, the, uh, early in the early hours of Sunday morning and there was no way we could have taken them to the communion service at six o'clock and so the whole thing was blown wide open at that point. And, uh, the brethren told us by the Tuesday night that we were shut up. And that's really the, it was that five minutes when they knocked on the door and told us that changed the whole of our lives. Everything has changed from then on. It took us a while to adjust. You can imagine among the brethren you have a very wide social circle and within five minutes we had nobody. The feelings of guilt really started with splitting the family apart completely. Because it was only me and Neil at home. And the rest of the girls were still at the meetings and they couldn't talk to us if they saw us in the street. Well, I started getting involved with drugs and stuff like that and uh, ended up in prison a couple of times. He got into it through being in jail and being with those sort of people and it was there in front of me. So I took it. Christine and Andrew were desperately trying to help their two sons get off drugs. They called on the support of the Brethren, but the leadership told them that they could only return to the Brethren if they disowned Rob and Neil. Well, the way they put it to us would have, would have meant that we would have been free, but the boys would have been anywhere. Um, and it wasn't acceptable to us. We were being torn in two halves. We had to try and decide which half of our family we were going to be with. These were people that had, we'd grown up with and followed the same um, code of practice for 50 years. Um, to us, it hardly seems Christian.
they have been reconstructing their family. Three of their daughters left the brethren and came home, but two more remained inside. It's a tremendous emotional shock to be outside of that protected environment and have to make your own decisions. You might think it's freedom and it's marvelous, but to begin with, it's a very, very, it, you, you feel very, very insecure and it, it does take quite a while to um, adjust to actually having the freedom to make your own decisions. Well, I think that the Brennan's attitude of family life is, is hypocritical because they say so much about the family, but they are, are seen to break up families. They, they claim that they don't, that it's the truth that makes the division, but there isn't the encouragement and the support for families to be reunited. No, we've lost our daughters. That's probably the single most dreadful thing we've lost, and our grandchildren, which is something that we shall never, we shall never really come to terms with. The, we have to accept it, but it's something that will be with us. It's, it's like a living death. They knew full well that uh, their actions um, uh, would eventually lead them away from the fellowship. I think that would be very fair to say that. It's my job, as it is with Garths and Gordons, to represent the spirit of the gospel to these people who have lost their way. When someone goes out of fellowship, as you will know, it's a major, ma major change for them. They're not equipped for the world. Um, therefore, we like, we, we like to help them. And if, as I say, and, and protect them. July 2001. Since her final decision to leave, Laura has had no contact with her family inside the Brethren. Which test are we going to get? She wants her parents to know about her children and her developing relationship with Trevor. Okay, let's go and see if you're going to be a daddy. <laughs> If thin, faint blue line comes up underneath that one, then I'll improve it. Go and get the leaflet from the out bathroom. Where is it? It's just on the towel. Can you just cross? No, look, it's coming up already, so I am. <laughs> look, can you see it? Oh, yeah. It's supposed to have a faint blue line under the, the big blue line, the dark blue line. Look, like on there, look. So, look. You're going to be a dad? <laughs> <laughs> I really would like my children to see their grandparents, even if it's only once. Um, so we're going to go down today and see my parents, and hopefully they will speak to the children. I'm expecting them to say, you know, you're not supposed to be here. Um, contact the priests and that'll be it. Then I'll be carted off the premises. But I'm, I'm hoping that it won't be like that. There's Grandpa and this is Rebecca. I just wanted you to see them. I know I wasn't supposed to come, but my friends have brought me down. I found out today that I was expecting another baby. You're going to give Grandpa a kiss then? Where are we going? We've got to go with him, innit? Because Grandpa and Grandma have got to go to church soon. I'm sorry, we can't say too much. I know. I know I'm not really supposed to be here, but. I really wanted you to see the kids. <laughs> Love you. I miss you. Lots. I miss you. I miss you too.
and the door was open, so I just knocked on the glass, and my mum come through, and she looked at me and said, hello, can I help you, as if she didn't recognise me. And then she went, oh, hello, you know, it's like she'd just recognised me split seconds after she'd just said, can I help you? Um, and I said, hello, mum, I said, I know I'm not supposed to be here, you know, I'm not, I'm not supposed to come. But I wanted you to see the children. And she looked at them and then she said, they're beautiful. And then she started talking to Rachel. I went to walk in the house and my mum put her hand up gently and as if to say no. And then Rachel wanted to go in and I said, no, darling, you're not allowed in. And it feels hard because the way that they were, it was as if they wanted me to be there. They wanted me to come in and wanted to get to know the children, but they just couldn't. And they knew that they would lose too much if they did. Um, almost as if they were too frightened to let me. January the 12th, 2002. An event within the exclusive Brethren changes their outlook. The Universal Leader, John Hales, dies. He's succeeded by his son, Bruce Hales. None of us would have known that Mr Hales currently was going to be the next man of God. It's something that, uh, you might say, is God-given. Um, his gift is undeniable. His, uh, his grasp of the truth, his grasp of um, mankind, his, uh, his deportment is one of a magnanimous, benevolent spirit. The new leader is instituting a new policy, hinted at by the insider. As far as I'm concerned, and most of my locally bees, there is some very weird agenda somewhere under the surface, and there are changes afoot. It now seems that local decisions are being questioned, and former members are being visited, even people who'd been ejected or left the sect 30 or 40 years ago with no subsequent contact with family inside. There has been, in the local areas, certain matters that haven't been dealt with correctly. And this is what you speak of, uh, of a review. And if there is anything to be looked at, then, as we say, it's been looked at. Since we drew these cases to the attention of the leadership, Laura Knight has had a visit from her family, and she's receiving help from them on a lavish scale. She's been given a car, a three-bedroomed house, and an apology from local priests. In some cases, that uh, they've uh, acted unwisely or hastily and not been thorough enough, and perhaps not shown the spirit of the glad tidings as uh, the way that uh, we've been shown in the mercy of God. Um, Mr. Bruce himself would say, you know, if he was given some facts about a matter that weren't accurate, he would say, well, OK, I would have misjudged that, but I can go by the facts I, 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 I judge on the facts I'm given. Andy Giles says he has been subjected to intense emotional pressure. He has limited access to his children, and the local priests now tell him that his wife will remarry him if he returns to the Brethren. If somebody makes a mistake in a matter of administration, they would confess that, they would realise that they've sinned in that way, and they would have, uh, they would take low or humble ground about it. They would, uh, you'd expect them to say, I'm sorry if they've caused some unnecessary problem. Missing his family and facing financial problems, Owen Cook returned to the Brethren. He says the world outside had offered him no happiness. The insider confirms his safe arrival. Owen is back in the bosom of his family and at the meetings. I don't know how serious he is about being back, but he seems reasonably cheerful, as far as I can tell. It's been acknowledged that uh, action was rather hastily arrived at. But we're very thankful that he's fully happy back with his family. He's taken up his privileges again, and is very happily back in fellowship with us, showing that um, you know, that's the way the Lord works. We all need saving. The Lord Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Owen Cook now refuses any further contact with former friends outside. 
Christine and Andrew Wallach have been visited by brethren priests, even by the universal leader. They've already received more than 120,000 pounds and attempts to persuade them to withdraw from this program. I actually have been to see Andrew and Christine over a lot sometime about two and a half, three weeks ago. I sat down with them in the lounge and I said, look, Andrew, look, Christine, we, we would love you back. We would really would love you back. It's where you deserve. It's what you deserve. It's where you should be. And, um, you know, we are reviewing their case at the moment. And, and we will put our hands up and say, yes, we were wrong if we were wrong. We asked the priests whether Christine and Andrew could look forward to contact with their daughters and grandchildren inside. If a person is opposed, very opposed to the brethren, for example, um, to, to expose the grandchildren to them, uh, we would be very careful. That is, that the whole concept of the family, which is, which is what, we, what we enjoy, what we seek to preserve, is protection. And uh, this is what is not found in the families around us. And uh, we, we just long and uh, desire to provide that protection uh, from every element of what's adverse. The insider is maintaining his double life, keeping some of his electronic devices concealed. But his torment continues. Suppose you get caught in a machine by your hands and you're going to be crushed to death. It doesn't make it any easier to cut off your hands. I'm just hanging on from day to day. They seem to be trying to hold on to people at the moment rather than push them out. And I suppose what they think is that eventually he will settle down, come to his senses, realize what is the right thing to do and dispose of them himself. He's quite accomplished at leading a double life. I think they all um, necessarily become accomplished at leading a double life. So much of their life has to be private. Being born into the sect, the children of exclusive brethren do not have a choice. Their future is acceptance of the rules and the leadership or ejection into a world they've learned to fear. The teaching of the Lord himself was such that separation, in certain cases, might have to be practiced. But the Lord makes it up, and he says that uh, we can expect persecutions, and in the coming age, life eternal. That's what really matters. If you look at the big picture, what's eternal is what really matters. Well, the Lord is coming again, and that's what we look for. In the meantime, we've got to fulfill the place that he's given us. In the holy fellowship of God's Son, and, uh, but we look and prepare ourselves, really, for the coming of the Lord Jesus. We believe the, the rapture is imminent, and after the rapture, you get the Lord's appearing. If you've been affected by any of the issues in tonight's program and would like to speak with an advisor about further sources of information and support, then call the BBC Action Line on 08000 934 